Hey, everybody here in our physical location, everyone who's watching as part of our online community, we are so excited to have you with us today. And I know we often open up every single Sunday like this, but it's incredible the number of people that watch as part of our online community. I was just with somebody uh, this week. I was incognito at the grocery store. I was not wearing denim on denim, yo, early that morning. And uh, they said, are you Pastor Michael? And I said, yeah. And they went on to say, for the last six, seven, eight months, uh, they've been watching Riverside online. I've never been here to our physical location, and I invited her to be a part of it. Last week, I was standing at the door, and uh, family had been watching online the previous week, and they said, we just wanted to check out what was going on here. And it was incredible. About three or four weeks ago, uh, there's a young man that was here visiting his sister here in Peoria, and he was so moved by what God did in this space during his visit that he's been watching online uh, every single weekend back home in California. We love you, Trey. Thanks for being a part of all that God is doing on the West Coast, but we're excited. Thank you for being with us. If we haven't met before, um, my name is Michael. I'm excited to be part of the pastoral team. I, I grew up, I was basically born and raised here in central Illinois, except for a couple of years where my mom and I, uh, we, lived in, we lived in Missouri, just outside of St. Louis. Anytime we go to St. Louis, the suburbs down there, Rach is like, I know, you don't have to get excited when you see Wentzville, Missouri coming up. That was my hometown back in Wentzville. And uh, I lived there when I was in second and third grade. And uh, we transferred schools. We moved right around this time of year in, in the fall. And I was excited uh, because the teacher on the first day said, hey, you came at the right time because in just a couple of weeks we're gonna have a, a Halloween party. And I was like, let's go, yo. And I, I came home and told my mom I, I needed to have a costume. And we went out uh, shopping that night and, and I picked out the Incredible Hulk, yo. Uh, I know I look like the Incredible Hulk. You see the similarities. And, uh, and it, was, it, was, it was so cool because then Halloween showed up and, and I went to school on that particular day. We were allowed to wear our costumes to school that morning and, and I showed up all excited to show off this new costume to my new friends and I turned around and there was somebody with the exact same Incredible Hulk costume. <laughs> but the thing that was different about it, it was our masks. Because if you grew up as an 80s kid like myself, you remember the masks were very flimsy. You would put them on and they were attached by a couple of staples and the skinniest rubber band you could ever find in history. That thing would snap. Some of y'all are, are you so young, you don't even know what I'm talking about. Like, I've seen that on Stranger Things. Um, but there was a boy in my class named Brad. Brad is like the most 80s Midwest name ever. And there was a kid named Brad that was wearing the exact same costume, but he had the next level mask. It was the kind of mask that you would put on your head and it would cover your whole head. Instantly, when I saw Brad's mask, there was envy popped out in my little second grade body. I just kept looking at Brad all day long, wearing that mask, wearing the same costume I had. And you know, the teacher said, hey, it's almost time for, for recess. You guys are gonna go outside for a few minutes. And hey, it's kind of chilly out there, so you may wanna put on your jacket. And I didn't have the heart to tell her, hey, all the comics that I've seen, The Incredible Hulk, he's not wearing a, a winter coat from JCPenney, yo. Like, I'm not, I'm not gonna wear it. And sure enough, the teacher was right. I came back in about three or four minutes later, freezing to come get my coat. And, and the room was completely empty. And as I walked in, I, I saw Brad's backpack in the very back of the room with that mask just sticking out of it. Okay, calm down. <laughs> and with no one looking, I crapped, crept, crapped. <laughs> crapped. Lord, I don't know where this is gonna go this morning. I crept to the back of the classroom and, and I saw the mask and I, I, I crept down and, and I took the mask and I put it on my head. And I was like, this is pretty, this is pretty cool. And in just a few seconds later, I felt a tap on the back of my shoulder and I turned around really quickly and it was my teacher. And, and she goes, what are you doing? I was like, I just wanted to try on Brad's mask. He has like the legit version. And I'll never forget what my teacher said all those years ago. She said, Michael, be happy with what you have. That seemingly simple interaction has stuck with me decades and decades later. Be happy with what you have. Last week, we started uh, a brand new series called Vampires, dealing with people who suck the life out of you. 
And if you missed week one, I wanna encourage you to download the podcast, go back to our YouTube channel, search for Riverside Pure, you'll be able to, to find it. Last week we talked about dealing with the, the vampires, the judgmental vampires in our lives. And, and today I wanna talk to you about how to deal with the jealous vampires in our life. See, jealousy, you need to know, won't change your situation. In fact, it actually has the opposite effect. You go back to the Old Testament in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30, it says, a peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. Jealousy is like cancer in the bones. See, jealousy, the more that it's left untreated, the more that it will spread, the more damage it will cause. See, that's why today we gotta talk, what do we do with jealousy in our lives? What do we do with the vampires of jealousy in our lives. If you were with us last week, we started to read through the book of Numbers. And then last week we read Numbers chapter 13 and Moses sends out the 12 scouts to, to take a look at Canaan, the promised land. And, and they came back and there were some great things that they noticed, but they came back with a really scary report. Man, fortified cities, giants, there's no way that we can take them. And you know, the Fear really spreads throughout the Israelites. You go ahead into Numbers chapter 14 and, and you see the Israelites, once again, they rebel. And, and God's anger starts to show forth. It goes on to say, hey, because of your lack of, of disobedience, because you're living a life of sin, what's gonna happen is that because you scouted Canaan for 40 days, I'm now gonna make sure that you wander in the wilderness for 40 years. See, there was consequences to their unbelief. There was consequences to their sin. You read Numbers chapter 15 and it starts to talk about offerings. It starts to talk about sacrifices. And when you turn the page to Numbers chapter 16 today, we're introduced to a new character. A new vampire, if you will, comes on the scene. And that's where we're gonna pick up in Numbers chapter 16, starting in verse one through three. It says, one day Korah, son of Izhar, a descendant of Kohath, son of Levi, conspired with Datham and Abiram, the sons of Eliab and On, son of Peleth, from the tribe of Reuben. They incited a rebellion against Moses along with 250 other leaders of the community, all prominent members of the assembly. They united against Moses and Aaron and said, you've gone too far. The whole community of Israel has been set apart by the Lord and he is with all of us. What right do you have to act as though you are greater than the rest of the Lord's people? See, now to give you some background of this passage, we said last week that Moses and Aaron are brothers. And now when you read this passage, we see that, that Korah is their cousin. Korah has spent a lot of time growing up with Moses and Aaron. In fact, we see that, that Korah was around when they found freedom from Egypt. He was there when God split the Red Sea and they were able to walk across it. He was there when God continued to provide food time and time and time again. See, Korah was wealthy in his own right. Korah had a very high position in serving the tabernacle. But one of the things that you see is it still wasn't enough for him. He was actually jealous that Aaron was chosen as the high priest. He wanted to be a priest in and of himself. And what does Korah do? Korah incites a full-on rebellion. But what did we talk about last week? We talked about so often the criticism that we carry is because of the company that we keep. We said last week that criticism is contagious, and that's exactly what is happening here in Numbers chapter 16. Korah is upset, and, and now his criticism has now spread to Dathan and Abiram. And now Dathan and Abiram are unsettled, and so now they take their criticism, and now it's spread to 250 other community leaders. You pick up in verse four, and it says, when Moses heard what they were saying, he fell face down on the ground. Then he said to Korah and his followers, tomorrow morning the Lord will show us who belongs to him and who is holy. The Lord will allow only those whom he selects to enter his own presence. See, so how do we deal with the vampires of jealousy in our life? Well, I think we go back and look at what did Moses do? 
Moses gives us a two-step plan of action. If you're taking notes today, what's the first thing that we see Moses do? Moses postured in prayer. That was Moses' first response time and time again as you read the Old Testament. Times where we see Moses stressed, overwhelmed, scared. Moses' first instinct is to go to God in prayer. If I'm honest with you, so often when I feel some of the same emotions as Moses, my first instinct isn't to go to God in prayer about the vampires in my life. So often I want to rip the faces off the vampires in my life. I want to get back to them. I want to give back what they've given to me. But time and time and time, when you read through the book of Numbers, see this phrase, he fell face down, becomes Moses' M.O. Five different times in the book of Numbers, we see this phrase attributed to Moses, he fell face down. Once, we read it last week in Numbers chapter 14, we see it once in Numbers chapter 20, but we see it three times in this chapter of Numbers chapter 16. He fell face down. He postured himself in prayer. When the responsibilities grew too great, when the people weren't listening, he postured himself in prayer. When you go back to verse five, what does it say? It says, the Lord will show us. Moses put his faith in trust in God. See, that had been, that had been what he'd done time and time again. You go back to Exodus chapter three. Exodus chapter three is the first time we ever hear about Moses. Moses has this encounter with God at the burning bush, and what does God say to Moses? I will be with you. You continue to read on in Exodus chapter three. It then goes on to say in just a few verses later, I will give you, I will lead you into the land flowing with milk and honey. You continue to read a little bit further into the book of Exodus. God speaks to Moses yet again and he says, I will free you from bondage. I will free you from the slavery of Egypt. And then God continues to go on throughout the text, he says, I will show you that I am God by changing the water of the Nile into blood. See, what does that tell us about Moses? See, because Moses had had an experience with God, he now had an expectation of God. See, because he had an experience with God in the past, he now had an expectation of God in the future. See, when you've seen God move in the past, when there are times that you get overwhelmed, there are times when you go through crisis, if I saw God do it in the past, I'm gonna trust that that same God is gonna be with me in the future. My experience has led to my expectation. See, Cora, when you really drill down on this text, What was Cora's issue? He had a lack of responsibility. I feel like I had a lack of responsibility. And when you study the text, you see that Cora was one of about 9,000 men that was responsible for taking care of the tabernacle, for overseeing the Ark of the Covenant, the altar, the lampstands. But when you see him talk through this, you see that he's unsettled. In fact, you can read this on your own this week in verse chapter, in, in verse nine, Moses has this conversation and he says, God has given you an incredible opportunity to serve, an incredible opportunity to minister to the Israelites. Is that not enough? But Korah, he wasn't satisfied with being one of the many. Korah wanted to be the one. Korah, when you see in the text, you, he was demanding. I want more responsibility. Korah was jealous of Aaron. He was jealous of Aaron and Aaron's sons that were able to serve at a higher level. See, having the attitude of Korah, I think is so common in our lives. See, we can look at the text, we can look at these verses and say, how dare he? But so often God will give us responsibilities. He will give us influence. He will give us position. And for some of us, it will never be enough. That's what Moses is walking through with Korah. But it would be overwhelming enough to just deal with this one dude. But he also turns and now he has Dathan and Abiram to deal with. He has an encounter with them picking up in verse 12. It says, then Moses summoned Dathan and Abiram the sons of Eliab, but they replied, we refuse to come before you. 
Isn't it enough that you brought us out of Egypt, a land flowing with milk and honey, to kill us here in this wilderness, and that you now treat us like your subjects? Once more, you haven't brought us into another land flowing with milk and honey. You haven't given us a new homeland with fields and vineyards. Are you trying to fool these men? We will not come. Korah's issue was a lack of responsibility. Dathan and Abiram's issue was a lack of respect. See, I think if we're not careful, we will have a lack of respect to those people who are in leadership over us. Our bosses, our teachers, our parents, our pastors. And see, what did they say? They say, we, re we refuse to come to you. Moses, we don't care what you say. We refuse, we refuse to submit and surrender to what you are asking us to do. And if we are not careful, we will have the same response in our life. See, these men, they challenge the claim of Aaron and his sons to be God's appointed ministers of the gospel. We see that they argued that the entire community had an equal right to the priesthood. They started to question Moses. They questioned his character. They questioned his integrity. And they said, Moses, you've gone too far now. And I think if we're not careful, we will do the same things to people in our lives. When we see the Lord elevate, move on people in our life, that they get a platform that we would so love to have, we will challenge people's motives. We will argue whether they are the right person for the job. We will question their calling. It's a dangerous place to be. Because when you question the opportunity of man, you are actually questioning the sovereignty of God. See, because what does God do? God is the one that promotes. God is the one that elevates. See, what is sovereignty? It means that God is in control of the entire world and he decides what happens. So when we question where God is taking someone else, we're actually questioning God dangerous place to be when we start to question what is God doing and we start to look at our own lives. See, I think for many of us, when I look back on our lives, I think so many of us in this room, so many watching as part of our online community were dissatisfied in life. Thought we'd be further along by now. I thought I'd have a relationship right now. I thought I'd be over that hurt. I thought I'd be more comfortable where I am right now. I think so many times our lack of satisfaction is so often tied into our lack of submission. Submission is a word that we don't like to talk about in church. Submission is a word that in 2023 is actually countercultural. True story, I did not even have this in my, my message for this week. And I was spending time with the Lord and he just started to download about what true biblical submission looks like. See, I don't know who this is for. In both this service, watching as part of our online community, in the nine o'clock service that we just had, but the Lord has put this on my heart that that I've gotta preach about submission. Submission is a dirty word. Submission actually comes from the Greek word hupatasso. Hupatasso means to submit under, to arrange under. It's actually a military term that has to deal with a military leader arranges his troops under the guidance and under the leadership of the man or woman who is assigned to lead them. See, submission you need to know before you get all cheeks. <laughs> submission is biblical. Submission is a biblical, is a biblical issue. And today I'm just gonna unpack as quickly as I can what does true biblical submission look like? But see, where do we take our cues from? We always, when we read God's word, we always take our cues from Jesus Christ himself in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Can I remind you, Jesus submitted. When you read the Gospels, some of Jesus' last days were in the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Garden of Gethsemane, 
Jesus is praying to his heavenly father. And he says, right before he's about to be arrested, right before he's about to be crucified, he comes to God and says, God, if it's possible, remove this cup, remove this cup of suffering from me. Nonetheless, I want your will to be done, not my own. He submitted to the authority of his heavenly father. Submission is biblical. See, today I wanna, I wanna show you what is true biblical submission look like in five different areas. And I am so aware, especially in this 11 o'clock service, there are not gonna be lots of claps, there ain't gonna be a lot of hallelujahs, cause submission sucks. Not easy. It's not fun. Some of y'all, I'm gonna step on your toes. You ain't gonna agree with me. Write down my email right now, michael.richardson at riversidepeoria.com. Don't take it up with me, take it up with God. Let's dive in, you ready? Say, I'm ready, Michael. Some of y'all acting like you're so excited, you ain't. (laughs) Ephesians 5, 21 through 26. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. First submission, we're gonna rip off the band-aid from number one. Wives, submit to your husbands. Biblical, not a lot of claps, okay, cool. We'll keep going, because I think what's happened, I think if you've grown up in church, um, submission from a wife to a husband has had a, a really negative connotation. I think there are some churches, some husbands that have preached like that's full authority over our spouses. That is not what is being preached here. It's not telling my wife, forcing my wife, telling Rachel, you better do this because I'm the head of household. That ain't what it is. And if you are a husband that is coming across that way and you are forcing your views, your opinions, your ways on your wife, you better come to a place of confession. Because that is not what God is telling us to do. See, in my family, in my relationship with with Rach over these last, man, 20 years we've almost been together now, over the last 20 years, can I tell you, 97% of the time we are in agreement. We are in alignment with decisions on on parenting and finances and and how we're going to uh, make sure our kids are in church. 97% of the time we are in alignment. God has bound us together. But can I tell you what happens? Those other 3% of the time, Rach says, I just trust you. You are my husband, you are the man of the house, you are the head of the household. I'm, I know we're not on the same page, but I'm gonna trust you. And if you're right, I'm gonna be here to celebrate you, and if you end up being wrong, I'm not gonna say I told you so. That's not what true marriage looks like. It's submission, and can I tell you, because so, so many men will pick out a piece of this scripture and say, wives, submit to your husbands, but do you understand the piece that we husbands so often skip over? It says, for husbands, This means love your wives. You cannot ask for your wife to submit to you and you not to love your wife in return. (laughs) Biblical submission, it's not authoritative. I think we've done a a horrible job in churches. I'm gonna move on, some of y'all are already pissed off. We're gonna keep going. (laughs) Secondly, 1 Peter 5, 5. You who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Number one, wives submit to your husbands. Number two, each and every one of us, we have to submit to the elders in our lives. The people who are just a little bit older than you. See, I'm about to be 46 years old next month. 46 years old, November 9th, put it in your calendar, size 13. Um, (laughs) And the older I get, the more I realize, the less I know. 
The older I get, the more I realize that I need the generation that's a little bit further ahead of me. That's why I need somebody like a Pastor John that has that's been a dad a little bit longer, been a husband a little bit longer, been a leader a little bit longer, been a pastor a little bit longer, followed Jesus a little bit longer. See, we need to submit. We cannot get to this place where we know everything because can I tell you, we don't. We need to submit to the elders that are in our lives. Maybe that's parents, maybe that's grandparents, maybe that's, that's spiritual leaders in this house, or maybe you're connected with people outside of your house. I think we're missing out if we get to this place where I know everything and I don't need anybody. I need to submit to the elders that are in my life. Number three, we're gonna keep going. Romans 13, one through two. Everyone must submit to governing authorities. <laughs> For all authority comes from God and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and they will be punished. Number three, we've gotta submit to our governing authorities. <laughs> Y'all, I cannot believe we are about a year away from another presidential election. It's gonna take me out because I still, listen, I still got PTSD from some of you during 2020. <laughs> Christians went crazy. They will know we are Christians by our political rants on Facebook. Not true, yo. Not true. See, I, I got really disappointed over the last four years because I understand you can be aligned with, with a political party. I know you could be aligned with a candidate, but not to bash fellow believers, not to bash other Christians, not to bash people who don't yet know Jesus. I think I saw people during 2020, Christians that were more passionate, passionate about their, their preferred political candidate than they are about Jesus. We cannot get to this place. We've got to submit to the governing authorities, our, our president, our mayors, our leadership. See, that's not sexy in 2023. We wanna bash everybody. See, we've got to be able to submit. It doesn't mean I agree with everything. See, some of you tonight, I think the Holy Spirit's speaking to some of y'all. I think some of y'all are gonna get home and you're gonna pull out that Pritzker suck sign out of your yard. I'm gonna drive by some of your driveways tonight and you're gonna be out there in the cold with like a hair dryer and a razor blade, like taking off that bumper sticker that says F Trump on the bumper. <laughs> gotta submit to our governing authorities. We gotta respect because can I tell you something that we so often, nobody's gonna like this, it's okay. Uh, here's what it says, because those men and women in those positions of authority have been placed there by God. God. So when you are rebelling against that authority, it says you are rebelling against what God has instituted. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. Uh, I'm going to keep going. Number four, Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. What I gotta submit to? I gotta submit to the spiritual leaders in my life. Pastors, eldership teams, ministry leaders, I've gotta submit to the authority. It's not always easy. Can I tell you, we're not always going to see eye to eye. We're gonna have different views on things. But can I tell you, the leadership of this church, we're always in prayer and trying to be guided by the Holy Spirit every single step of the way. We wanna be so in tune with the Holy Spirit. See, when you, when you read that passage, it, it goes on to say, let them do this with joy and not with groaning. Some of y'all are joyful. Some of y'all, we lead with lots of groaning. See, I want to get to the place where we may not always agree on everything. See, can I tell you part of the weight, we're going to just dive into it today. I think part of the weight of, of leading this house is there's lots of people that 
you are praying for vision for Riverside Community Church. And dare I say, it's not your place to pray for vision for Riverside Community Church. That comes from, that comes from the leaders. I, I, I'm always grateful to sit down with you and, and listen. But can I tell you what I've learned in almost four years in, in, in leading this house through the help of the Holy Spirit is that this is for any leaders that are in this room, any leaders in any sector you will learn more about a person when you tell them no rather than when you tell them yes. Listen, this is real talk in real time in the last week. You will learn more about somebody's heart. You will learn more about somebody's character when you tell them no or not yet rather than when you tell them yes. See, because if you tell someone no and and, and tell them a no and they say, I get it, Michael, I'm gonna trust you, I'm gonna continue to serve. I know it's not my time yet. I'm gonna allow the Lord to develop me. I'm gonna get around other leaders. I'm gonna go to those those elders, those people that are a little bit ahead of me, and I'm gonna be like a sponge, and I'm gonna take it in, because I know I'm not quite ready. My gosh, that's when you're gonna see elevation from God, when you're willing to do the work. But can I tell you, people get ticked off all the time in churches, not just Riverside. I talk to pastors all the time, and they say, Michael, I told this person no that had been showing up to our church for the last couple years, and they were out. Deuces. Because, dare I say, in church they got butt hurt. They were told no, they were told not yet, and off they went. See, can I, I'm just gonna get in the weeds with you. If you're somebody that gets hurt when somebody tells you no and you question the timing, I think you need to go back and read the Old Testament story of David. David was a man, I could preach a whole message on, on David, but David was a man who was plucked from obscurity on the surface did not look like a guy that the Lord was gonna use, but he was anointed by God, but he wasn't yet appointed. It was year to year to year until he was actually appointed as the king of Israel, but what did David do? David served King Saul, the person he was gonna replace one day. He went back in, in the field and continued to be a shepherd. See, how you handle the no. How you handle the not yet will determine if you ever move from the pasture to the palace. How you handle the no, how you handle the not yet will determine if God ever elevates you from the pasture to the palace. And so we've got to get to this place where we're just submitting. I'm going to submit to God's leading, God's timing in my life. Ultimately, what's the fifth thing we see? It says in James 4, 7, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Number five, ultimate submission, submitting to God. God, I'm gonna give you my plans. I'm gonna give you my finances. I'm gonna give you my family. I'm gonna give you my relationships. See, submission is biblical, but can I also tell you, submission is transformational. When you start to submit everything to God, watch the prayers that get answered. Watch the healing that starts to take place in your heart, in your mind, in your physical body. Watch what the Lord starts to do if you would just start to submit. See, I have people all the time that say to me, well, Michael, why hasn't God opened the door? I've been sitting here waiting. Told me to wait on God's timing. Tell me to pray, and I've been praying a little bit more. Can I tell some of you, so often I've seen in my life, our lack of elevation is so often connected to our lack of submission. Because we are trying to hold on to something. We are trying to manufacture and maneuver something where if we would just take our hands off the wheel and we would just start to submit it all to God, what your submission will then lead to your elevation. See, that's what Cor. Cor was trying to do it all on his own. He was looking for something more. I think so many times in, my, in our lives, we focus on the next rather than focusing on the now. I start to, man, here's what I want to do next, God. Make it happen. And God is saying, I've got to prepare you in this season. 
See, standing here on this platform today has been a 30-year journey to get me here. So many people want elevation and platforms. Overnight, I'm going to write the book. I'm going to start the blog. I'm going to start the podcast. I want to listen to another podcast, yo. If you would just wait and submit everything to God, watch what happens because my story as a 17-year-old kid, I went to college as a journalism major. I have an associate's degree after two years in journalism. And one of the things I had to get really, really good at in college was listening to people. I would go out on assignments, stories, and I had to ask a lot of questions and I just had to listen. See, that's part of my role right now. Every single day, I sit down with people and I just have to listen. What is, what's going on in your life? I have to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. I eventually spent 15 years in a third grade classroom, over 15 years, I, I realized the gift and the art of teaching, of communicating, of making things applicable to every single person that was in a room. It's a skill that I've been developing over and over again for the last 20 years. During that time, I shared with you last week, I, I was a, I was a, a, a councilman in, in Pekin. During those four years, I had to get really good at listening to lots of different opinions, lots of different ideas, lots of different voices, just like I do as the Lord guides us to lead this church. I came out of the classroom and went to be the student pastor in this house for about two plus years. In that time, I'd never preached a message before in my life until 2017. And over those two years, I learned how to preach. I learned how to communicate. See, all of those things from, from listening to teaching to dealing with people to preaching was a 30-year journey that led me here today. So often it is not overnight success. Could it be that your current position is actually preparation for future promotion? See, some of you right now, you don't need to rush through it because your current position may just be preparation for the future promotion that God wants to do in and through you. Don't waste the waiting. Don't say, I got every answer in the book. No, I'm gonna trust God every single step of the way. See, Moses, what did he do? He postured himself in prayer. See, when I go to God, I think we've gotten... We've gotten it kind of twisted in the church. You feel like I, I've got to go in and I've got to have these perfect and polished prayers. Can I tell you, God isn't looking for polished prayers. He's looking for personalized prayers. He's looking for prayers where, where you cry out to God with whatever you're walking through, whether it's the celebrations or the setbacks. The best kind of prayers are real prayers. Where you come to God, God can handle the weight of what you're walking through right now. He's not looking for you to tickle his ears. See, why do I love the Old Testament book of Psalms so much? Because we see David, David is hot mess express. David has highs and lows and everything in between. He's depressed one moment and he's rejoicing in God the next. You read Psalm chapter 22. I was just in it this week. That's some homework for you. Read the entirety of, I think it's 31 verses. Psalm chapter 22. Listen to how it starts, starting in verse one. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far away when I groan for help? Every day I call to you, my God, but you do not answer. Every night I lift my voice, but I find no relief. Can I tell you how often my prayers sound a lot like David's here? God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far away? Why does it seem like everybody else's prayers get answered but not mine. I'm sitting here in bed again crying out to you and I find no relief whatsoever. 21 verses. We see David in this place. 21 verses in Psalm chapter 22 where he's just in this depressed state but something starts to shift in verse 22. 
even in the midst of his pain, he says, I will still continue to proclaim your word. I will still continue to, to praise you, God, even in the midst of my hardship. What if we became like David and we had real personalized prayers, but we continue to praise God in the midst of it? God, I don't know why you're putting me through this. I don't know why the prayer hasn't been answered, but I'm trusting you every single step of the way. So you continue to read in Numbers chapter 16, picking up in verse 20, it says, and the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, get away from all these people so that I may instantly destroy them. But Moses and Aaron, they fell face down on the ground. Oh God, they pleaded, you are the God who gives breath to all creatures. Must you be angry with all the people when only one man sins? And the Lord said to Moses, then tell all the people to get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan and Abiram. So Moses got up and he rushed over to the tents of Dathan and Abiram, followed by the elders of Israel. Quick, he told the people, get away from the tents of these wicked men. Don't touch anything that belongs to them. If you do, you will be destroyed for their sins. So all the people stood back from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Then Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the entrance of their tents together with their wives and children and little ones. See, number one, what do we see? Moses postured himself in prayer. And number two, as we start to land this plane, what's the second thing he did? Moses pleaded for peace. Moses pleaded for peace. See, when you read the full text of Numbers chapter 16, it blows my mind that, that Moses went to God and said, hey, can you hold back your vengeance? Can you hold back your destruction? Why? Because for 16 chapters, the Israelites have been punks. Questioned Moses and Aaron. Ran their names down. Said it would be better to go back to Egypt. See, if I were Moses in this situation and God said to me, hey, hey, Michael, hey, I'm going to destroy these Israelites, I would be like that Michael Jackson meme from Thriller just eating the popcorn. I would be waiting to watch it all go down. You get what you deserve, bro. But that's not what Moses did. Moses extended peace. He prayed for peace. Now, these were the men that conspired against him. These were the men that incited a rebellion against him. These were the men that refused to come close to him when he called. These were the men that stirred up the whole community against them. But Moses pleaded for peace and he goes to them and he says, quick, come on, move. It says that he rushes towards them. Now you need to know the Jewish men during this time in biblical history would never run. It was unseemly. It went, it went against culture for men to do any kind of running whatsoever. But he was so moved. He had a passion for the protection of the Israelites that he ran to warn them. He rushed to them. What does Jesus say to us in the New Testament? Luke 6, 27. But to you who are willing to listen, I say love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. You go on to read in Romans chapter 13, verse 13 and 14. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity, in immoral living, or in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. Can I just remind you that for each and every one of us, Jealousy is a sin. I think when you look at what Paul outlines here, he lists six different sins. Quarreling, jealousy, drunkenness, wild parties, sexual immorality. See, I think if we're not careful, we will have this sliding scale of sin. And we will say, well, I'm jealous about that person's trip that I see on Instagram. Michael, are you sure that's a sin? I'm not as bad as this dude over here who's stepping out on his wife. And what is Paul trying to tell us? Sin is sin is sin. 
have, have nothing to do with any of those things. Several years ago, while I was still in the classroom, I had some time off. It was right after Liam was born. Liam's 16 years old now. Tells you how long ago this was. And I took about three weeks just to be home with, with Rach and Ella, who was little at the time, and, and Liam, who was just born. And my principal called and said, hey, uh, we need you to come in for this special assembly. One of your students is gonna get honored. So I said, oh, cool, I'll, I'll be there. And when I got there, when I showed up, I realized that the assembly was actually for me. That day when I showed up, uh, the TV crew from WEK, Channel 25 was there, and uh, I was awarded the WEK Golden Apple Award, yo. Okay, thank you. And it was cool, it was, it was unexpected, and uh, I didn't think anything of it. I took this home with me. I put it on my, my desk in my office at the house. And when I came back a couple of weeks ago, I noticed that this, this one teacher was very cold to me. This was a teacher that we kind of had some issues in the past because I was this young kind of teacher and, and she'd been doing it for 25, 26, 27 years. And she would often pop in my room to tell me to, to quiet down a little bit. She'd often tell me, oh, don't give them, don't give them glue to use. You gotta have glue sticks. She would criticize art projects that we had going on. And so when I, I came back, she was especially cool to me. And I said something to one of my fellow teachers and, 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 and she said to me, oh yeah, she's not happy with you. The last two weeks, she has just been running your name into the ground. She'd been doing it for decades, and I was like four or five years into my teaching career. Jealousy. And I know you're expecting me to say that I continue to love on her. I know you're expecting to say that I was the mature one of the two of us, and we sat down and had a, a heart-to-heart conversation, and we hashed it out. No, that's not what happened. I came back with this under my arm, back to school, and... Back in the day, if you were in Mr. Richardson's classroom, if it was your birthday, I would, I would hold you up like Simba in The Lion King. That's, that was like your birthday and you get to pick out a treat or whatever. And, and this particular teacher hated it because I would do full volume. It would echo down the halls of this K3 building and she hated it. So when I got back, I did even louder. She had a, a, a certain spot where she always sat in the teacher's lounge. And so I'm not proud of this. Let me preface by saying that. That that day before she was going in to eat lunch, I, I just happened on accident to leave this right where she sat. And I just sat back as I was eating my chips and bologna sandwich and I just watched her stew. And I loved every single minute of it. Not proud of that moment. In fact, this award, I had to go searching for it this week. We were talking about jealousy. I had to go looking for this in our, in our basement, to our basement of art. Because when I look at this, it doesn't take me back to a, a, a time of celebration it actually represents a really embarrassing season for me. Didn't handle that well. Wasn't a, a, a man after God's own heart in that moment and disappointed about how I acted and I wish I spent more time in God's word. I wish I was closer in my walk with Jesus back then as I am today. I, I wish I had read what Moses did in Numbers chapter 16, because I would have I would have handled this a lot differently. I would have stewarded it a lot better. So I would have taken, I would have taken my cues. When you look at the passage here in Numbers chapter 16, I, I would have tried to fall in, in Moses' footsteps.
those steps. See, they conspired against Moses, but he was compassionate towards them. They incited a rebellion against Moses, but he interceded on their behalf. He prayed to God for them. It goes on to say that they refused to come towards Moses, but what did he do? He, he continued to spread forgiveness towards them. See, these men, they stirred up the whole congregation, the whole community against Moses and Aaron, but what did Moses do? He started to stir up God's mercy towards them. And I think when we look at this text, I think it gives us our marching orders at the start of this brand new week. When we come across vampires in our life, the vampires of jealousy in our lives this week, I pray that we're men and women of God that lead with compassion. I pray that we're men and women of God that intercede for our enemies, that we pray for them rather than bashing them. I pray that we are men and women who love to send and give out forgiveness. I pray that we're men and women of God who are merciful towards them because we've experienced the mercy of our Heavenly Father. And when you've experienced His mercy, it should flow out of us onto every single person that we interact with. All over this place today, will you just stand to your feet? I wanna pray for you. I know it's not easy because so many of us, if we're honest, you're just like me. When people come against you and inflict pain, we wanna give it right back. Can I remind you this week as we step into week two, don't bite, be nice. Don't bite, be nice. I'm gonna continue to posture in prayer. I'm gonna continue to now allow peace. I'm gonna allow my peace to go through. I'm gonna allow God's Holy Spirit to guide and direct my actions, my words. So dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for every single person under the sound of my voice today. I think, thank you that no matter the mistakes of our past, Lord Jesus, you can rewrite a beautiful future that you have for each and every one of us. And I'm so grateful that we don't go through this alone. Lord, I'm so grateful for your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray in this moment that for those of us who have tried to do it on our own, who failed to submit to you, Lord Jesus. I believe that our elevation only comes from when we submit our lives completely and totally over to you. So I pray in this moment right now, Lord, you can have it all. I give it all to you, Lord Jesus, in your beautiful timing and the beautiful plan that you have for my life and my marriage and my kids and my family in this church, Lord Jesus. We trust you every single step of the way as we step into a brand new week through your Holy Spirit, don't bite, be nice. I thank you, Lord Jesus, every single step of the way. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. I can't wait to see you back here week three. I love you guys, have the best week.